Well, you know, what a great panel we have. And uh, I'm just really thankful that everybody's giving us their time on a Sunday to come and talk to us. Um, and uh, I'm going to, oh, great, people come in now. It's great. Good. Yeah, say hi in the comments. Uh, as I say, let us know where you're coming from. Uh, I've got the piling in now, which is great. Uh, let us know. Um, we've got a couple of moderators in there. Great. Oh, hi. We've got Austria. Oh, we got sorry, we've got Australia. We've got Utah, Detroit, Gloucester. <laughs> Good old Gloucester at the road. Oh, Devon as well. Germany, Connecticut. Right, they're all coming in. Great. Good to see you all. Okay, well, welcome. Uh, welcome to the panel. Hi, everybody. Uh, so what we wanted to do with our little chat today uh, is to, to think really about what a positive future direction we should be looking at as a, as a community, really, because we've had a lot of things happen in the last year or two, really, about the ongoing discussions uh, and a lot of them referring back to some of the things regarding methods and tools and uh, and for me anyway, I think some of these discussions represent the past for us about this notion of how we best get animals to behave and do things on our behalf. I think we've learned so much in the last few years, really, about the rich, lived physical, emotional and social experience of dogs that I think the status quo just isn't tenable now. We have to think about, so what does this mean then? What does this mean about how we train? How does this mean about when we turn up to the behavior of another living sentient being? How do we best bear witness to that with what we do? Um, and this isn't about whether we train or not, or whether we get involved or not. It's about how we try and do it in a way that is, as well as the things that we need and the things that we experience uh, and the things that we feel the dog has to um, deal with with the world around them and the, and the lives they have to live, but also understanding more about their own intrinsic needs, especially those needs around safety. And so that's what we're going to have a look at today and offer a future vision. Then, because if that's the past, what is the future? Then, where should we be moving towards? What, what direction of travel do we have? And for me, especially, it's where do we draw that line in the sand now and say, well, that is those past discussions. This is the future. Now, those aren't even worth having anymore, actually because they don't represent what is in the best interest for the dog or for the caregivers, actually. And I think the general public, especially whilst we've all been having these discussions, have um, have been let down a little bit in the past because they picked up the message about making sure they have a compliant dog, right? A dog that's well-trained and compliant, but haven't heard the messages about stress, body language, pain, um, development stages, all these kind of things that we what we know more about now. So I think we owe it to them and to the dogs uh, that we deliver things in a different way moving forward. And that's what we're going to have a discussion about today. So I think everybody's in the, everybody's come into the space, which is great. We've got great live people, um, great live people, great, great numbers of people watching live, which is great. So let's start off with this then. So actually part of this for me is about thinking about the mindset that we have, thinking about the lens through which we look at behavior how we look at training and how that keeps evolving all the time you know it's always evolving how we do things you know things are we don't do the th same things that we did uh, a few years ago as, as professionals we're always growing and developing um victoria i wanted to start off with speak to you really hi good to see you yeah nice to be here thanks for inviting me well we had a chat didn't we a, a few weeks ago really this is kind of how, how this evolved really just talking about uh, you know, so many things have moved on and and, 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 and we were kind of um, almost exasperated that we're the still saying the same kind of discussions were still going on on social media when there's so much for us to move forwards with now. And of course, you know, um, compared to the rest of the panel, one thing that's very unique for you, of course, is that um, you've had TV cameras uh, following you around for a lot of your own career. Uh, a career that has um, shown your own growth and how you've changed and how with your mindset. So what are the things for you personally that have changed over that time? And, and, and how have you managed to stay able to shift that mindset? Because actually that's a hard thing to do because a lot of people end up doing the same thing for 30 years, right? They don't actually shift very much. Um, I do think it's a lot of people that I have looked up to uh, who have influenced me. 
Suzanne being one of them who's on here right now. So, um, but Patricia McConnell, people like that who really helped me um, evolve. And, you know, I definitely learned over 25 years ago. So it was much more pack hierarchy and I subscribed to that way. And when I came up with the idea of it's me or the dog, that was very much sort of in play at that time. I always thought it was a bit weird, but that's how I learned. And that's what uh, I had been taught. And then I, I just thought this is just odd. I don't feel like dogs are actually, when they're misbehaving, trying to take over the household and trying to be top dog. I think that's just sort of a human creation. And that's when I discovered Patricia McConnell and she truly changed the way I did things. And yes, I've, it's 20 years of It's Me or the Dog <laughs> this year, 20 years um, since I had the idea. And I have evolved and you can see how I've evolved throughout. So I definitely was more punishment based when I started. And though I never used shot collars and I never physically touched a dog, like that, I definitely used a lot of sound aversion and was very tough and wagged my finger. And, um, but the, the change is hard. And I'd say that change is really hard. And sometimes you have to look at yourself in the mirror and go, okay, I have the humility to accept that I have more learning to do and I'm gonna go on that journey. And I went on that journey. And the thing about going on that journey is that it was so exciting. And that's why I'm excited today because if we can help others go on that journey and others go, you know, take a look at what they're doing and say, hey, I like the bits of these, but I'm not too sure about this. And so I'd like to change that. How do I do it? And there's great information out there to show people how to do it, that's when it's exciting. And so to be part of this discussion today where we are looking forward, because I agree with you, Andy, looking back, it's kind of miserable actually, and it makes you miserable. But looking forward is full of hope and the mind's not just on here, but in the dog training industry, the new minds that are coming into the dog training industry as well are what is going to propel this forward. And so I'm really excited about what we can achieve moving forward because at the end of the day, it's really not about us at all. It's about dogs. And because they can't speak in the language of our tongue, <laughs> we have to learn about them if they're going to live successfully in our homes. And we owe it to them to do that as ethically as we can with their welfare and well-being foremost in our minds. I love that. And I, and I really value your <clears throat> kind of um, your own vulnerability and what you've shown people over the many years and, and how you've evolved and, and allowed yourself to grow. Because I think, uh, especially in the public eye, I think that's a, that's a big thing. And also, I think to recognise that, um, uh, you know, I know it's a bit of a cliche, but this thing about, you know, we know, we know better, we do better. I think this is the key. And, and we've learned more and more and more as the new time moves on. We've all been in that place. I think most of us are crossover uh, caregivers or trainers uh, to some point because we are uh, kind of convinced within our, uh, often our, our kind of cultural biases really that, that we somehow need to control we have to control the child's behavior we have to control the dog's behavior and you know that behavior is bad so therefore we must correct it it all seems very what we should do until we start learning more and as you say a lot of us we felt bad about some of this stuff it didn't feel quite right but now we know why it didn't it wasn't just about our own feelings thinking actually my dog's my friend and i don't really want to be this now we think oh my god the science is there to support this there's so much richness there not just the science around how we make dogs do stuff and i think that's where we focused on things and how we've applied learning theory even in the past rather than thinking about how do these animals behave and how do they learn we've in the past we focused more on how do we use that information to get them to behave and this is the shift. And it's actually quite freeing, isn't it, Victoria? I think when you start to see this stuff and you feel it. Um, Sindor, I just want to bring you in here because um, 
uh, we've had discussions in in dog centre care, uh, and I think this this mindset shift is important because um, the excellent Bark series, by the way, Sindor is the director of Barks. Uh, and we had an excellent series of conversations from Barks in, in Dog Centre Care, really going into a lot of the kind of um, these individual things. But but we discussed um, aspects around uh, intersectionality and reflexivity and all these kind of things that come into this. Share your thoughts on the mindset side of things. I know it's something that's very um, important for you about how we look at this in the first place and how we even perceive behaviour. Right. Um, I think... You know, the more we've been kind of exploring um, the conversations around dogs, around uh, not just how we ask them to do things, but what is it that we ask them to do, why we ask them to do it. Um, I think the more uh, what we kind of are beginning to see is that it's not an isolated conversation about dogs. Dogs really sit at the intersection of so many things. Um, and I given my exposure to free living dogs, I think I, I get to witness them from so many aspects of it, um, ranging all the way from sort of um, a reflection of our politics, of our political views, of our cultural biases. And so <clears throat> this conversation around how do we get dogs, what is the best and the most humane way to get dogs to behave the way we want them to behave? But dig deeper, what is it that, why is it that we want them to behave the way we want them to behave? What is the need for that? Where is that coming from? And if, and, and, and most of the times I've kind of asked this question, the response has al almost been a, well, that's, what, what are you talking about? Do you mean to say they don't have to behave? Uh, yeah, I do mean to say they don't have to behave. I do mean to ask pose that difficult question and get you to sit in that discomfort a little bit because um, why uh, a, a lot of these beliefs actually are rooted in cultural beliefs as much as we don't want to admit it, they are. They're not facts, really. This idea of uh, this, uh, this is a topic I talk about quite a bit more recently and sits very nicely on um, the intersectionality kind of you know, list of topics with ecofeminism also thrown in there, which is the idea of nature versus culture. This idea that culture is superior to nature and that we have to somehow behave in cultured ways and get our animals to behave, get our children to behave, get our women to behave in cultured ways and civilized ways so that, you know, and and sort of conquering everything natural and uh, expressing our domination over everything natural and for what? For what? It boils down to, well, this is the way we've done it. This is the way we have expressed our dominance as a race, as a people, as a tribe, whatever it is. And so these are these are, at the end of the day, cultural norms that have been passed down. The entire world does not do things the same way. And the outcome of you know, these things are not necessarily more superior than the other. And so for me, I think the exciting part, or, or we sit at the crux of something exciting, and that is openness to listen to other ways of doing things, the openness to explore other ways of doing things. How do other people live with their dogs? What's going on there? And I think that brings to the fore uh, shines a light on a lot of cultural biases that we have that we've been carrying with us as if it were fact, as if it were the you know the law of nature. But at the end of the day, it's just a cultural bias that's what three hundred mm -hmm. years old, five hundred years old, so on and so forth, right? Um, and and then that kind of starts dissolving a lot of these ideas, and you start asking yourself, okay, why do I want this 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 uh, interspecies relationship that I, I share with this uh, with this beautiful another species, an adult of another species, why do I want this to be about control? Why do I want this? What does it say about me? And so I also talk about the idea of the animal mirror, right? Which is kind of, you know, we shine, um, the animals shine a light on ourselves. We look at them and we see ourselves. So we start asking these difficult questions. If you are willing to, and I say you, it's pretty much me as well, you know, at one point in my life, willing to um, go down the route of I will do what it takes in order to get what I want. Uh, and that, you know, take away the dog from the picture. How unhealthy is that? 
right? That statement is very unhealthy. But somehow, if you say it's about the dog and say, I will do what is required so that my dog gives me what I want, somehow that's acceptable. And that is a social vice. So I think it is shining a light on several of the social vices that we have carried with us for a long time. And it's exciting for me to see little chinks in it that are beginning to crack to say, um, no, I don't think this this reveals great things about ourselves. Maybe we should ask ourselves different questions. And quite honestly, it leads to a path of extraordinary kindness and acceptance, acceptance of messiness, of messiness of life, of our own messiness. Um, and and to me, that's that's the that the that's the hope. That's the healing, right? That's the beginning of the healing. So animals to me offer asking these difficult questions and animals to me offer the opportunity for us to start our self-healing and, and that can go a long, long way. And I can talk a lot about that. So I'll stop. But I love that. I think it's really powerful what you said there. And, I, and, and this notion about asking different questions, this is what this is all about, actually. I think a lot of the discussions we see on social media are just asking the same questions. <clears throat> These are different questions. And I think we'll, we'll touch on this in, a, in another section coming up in a bit. But <clears throat> when we think about the individual lived experience, we all, we're all a unique um, combination of our own you know, genetics, trauma, you know, secure, insecure attachments, all the things we could talk about in, in the second section, that will also go a long way to drive our response to things and the way that we see stuff. And so many people who get stuck, especially in this notion of, well, if the if the reinforcement doesn't work, maybe we should do something more punitive or those who even just go in with just the punitive because guess what? It gets the job done. There's often a normalization of pain for them based on their own experiences and their own kind of um, uh, way of um, coping with the world. I think the beautiful thing about these discussions, it offers us a chance to free ourselves from some of this stuff and some of the conditioning that we have, actually. And that's why it's so powerful. This is why it's a really it is a vision of hope, I think, for us all, not just for the dogs. You know, the dogs are waiting for us for sure. But. Many of us have experienced this ourselves through our own uh, through our own way that we've looked at these things. Um, Maya, I, I think this is a good point to come to, to you. Hi, Maya. Hi. Um, I, I think it's really interesting. Uh, with obviously you you do a lot of um, great work on in the in the dog training world, but but of course you have your your uh, philosophy hat, which I think this is where we're going here a little bit. I think, and and especially that uh, phenomenology. Uh, I can barely say phenomenon. <laughs> I was really practiced that in my head. Uh, Laura will know I can't even pronounce the workshops that you, you and I have done in the past. Sometimes, but um, but yeah. So bring this in a little bit then, because this this is a this is a, this, we are coming into an element of philosophy here, aren't we? About thinking about the impact we have on another sentient being in our just just through the quality of our presence. Yeah, absolutely. And um, by the way, I think they make phenomenology purposefully hard to say. I think it was a purposeful <laughs> decision. Um, but yeah, I, I was thinking about what you just said, Cinder, about asking different questions and how in mindset and in training, at least the way that I was brought into dog training, it was very much um, a competition between sort of traditional training and a newer, more kinder, positive training. And the the idea was anything you can do, I can do better, right? So there was a sort of this one-to-one -one set. You show me what your task is, I'll show you how I can do it, that same task better. And I think that for me, uh, limited what was possible to see in the training relationship and just in the relationship generally with dogs. If we ask different questions about what we want or what's possible uh, between dogs and people, if we ask different questions about who's on the other side, right? Who are we having a conversation with? Then we may get answers that are not better or worse. They are just qualitatively different um, than the kinds of anything you can do, I can do better kind of challenge and response. And I think we're at a point where I hope where we can start to ask those questions more seriously. Some of that because of, uh, as you were saying, Andrew, different scientific studies that have come out. But I honestly think that some of this knowledge, so I grew up on a ranch, right? Um, I grew up with, with people who had handled animals for generations. Some of this knowledge was already there, 
and globally is already there. Um, and it's it's not necessarily a pure story of progress when it comes to how we treat to treat animals and particularly how we treat the animals on whom we depend um, or have depended for our livelihood. So yeah, thinking about the what it's like, that's how I would translate the phenomenology of the dog, like what it's like to be a dog. Thinking about the what it's like, I think does uh, really bring up different questions and different possibilities for how you might interact that go beyond uh, good or bad behavior or even good or bad consequences for behavior. And that's an important point, isn't it? Because I think you know we're all kind of indoctrinated in that good bad continuum as we class it in, in human psychology. I think you know that some uh, that behavior is good, that behavior is bad, and we 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 want more good and we want less bad. But but when we start thinking about who's deciding what's good or bad and what those behaviors actually represent for the other, and I think there's some things that are universal. I think it's great, like you said, Mayor, and it's similar with Suzanne's experiences with all your animals, Suzanne, on the. That you have on your ranch i think there's things that unite us all on a very fundamental level and you know we all want to feel heard for a start off you know through how we communicate especially when we're trying to communicate real need i noticed somebody in the chat said um you know are we saying there should be no boundaries then but i think yeah you know, boundaries are important rules are important but they shouldn't be barriers to unmet need and i think as a society we see what the damage that happens to children who then become adults and dogs and animals where those unmet needs are not met because somebody else's vision of what conformality should be. And I think this is where it starts to break down some of these notions that we've had. And I know from myself working in, in human therapies with adults, how many of them are severely damaged by that process as a child. It's difficult. You know? And we all want to feel safe, Mayor. I think this is the key, ultimately. Um, and our own version of safety, not somebody else's. I think that's the key. And we tend to have a bias towards physical safety when we think about safety in another because that's what we can easily get feedback for. But actually our own sense of safety is just as much grounded in emotional safety and, and social safety, of course. I think that's really important things for us to consider there. Um, uh, thank you, Laura, come to you, Danny. So we did, a, we did a workshop a little while ago called uh, Behavior Matters, But Mindset Matters More, because actually how we perceive things as a kind of a general little law really with with human psychology that perception truly is everything because how we perceive something often drives our responses um and i know this is a big part of what you try and uh, educate about actually is is not so much about how to do stuff but how you see and feel things in the first place oh you're, you're muted uh laura there you go um yeah, I, you know, I, I feel I've always felt great empathy, compassion with um, any subject, human, canine, uh, sheep, because I have a flock of sheep, <laughs> um, who don't measure up to that laundry list of the well-behaved subject, because never in my life, ever, have I been successful in measuring up to being well-behaved, <laughs> not as a child, not as an adult. Um, and so uh, I, you know, I think we are still in the throes and this is picking up on what Maya just said and Sindor and Victoria, uh, we're we're stealing, still dealing with the throes of what's called the great chain of being. Uh, this is a 17th, 18th century kind of worldview where humans are at the top and then there's a hierarchy of subjects and dogs are actually toward the bottom, they were. And I think it's important to remember that it wasn't really that long ago that people didn't even believe dogs felt pain. Um, so, uh, you know, this is a, this is a huge transformation uh, from that view to viewing uh, our relationship with dogs and other uh, animal species as, as a partnership uh, involving interspecies cooperation and 
part of a partnership is, you know, I have responsibilities, you have responsibilities, we both get a great deal from this relationship. And I listen to you, you listen to me. It's very mutual. We're having conversations all the time. And I'm changing what I'm doing depending on what I'm hearing from you. Um, so I don't hold the laundry list of what you should be doing. It's always in flux. And I think <clears throat> I, I started out uh, when I, I've now been officially a behavior specialist, a trainer, whatever the word is, for about 25 years. And, um, you know, I, I think the thing that really changed it for me was learning, and this is part of the new science that is emerging of the canine subject, that dogs and humans have very similar emotional and social brains. Doesn't mean we think alike and we don't talk alike, but we both communicate. Um, we, we process information from the environment in very similar ways. We use that to make decisions about our behavior. Um, and we respond to, for example, trauma in very similar ways. And so once you start thinking along those lines, it's really impossible to keep hold of that, the past, hierarchical, great chain of being, humans at the top, uh, you know, everyone else kind of in a graded hierarchy. And it's really changed what we mean by intelligence, too. Um, I, I have found one reason I love animals so much is I've often found them much more intelligent than humans. And I know everyone on this panel has had that experience, socially intelligent, emotionally intelligent, more transparent. Um, and, and so I, I think uh, I, I think I want to give just a really concrete example, because uh, we've been talking, rightly so, in a lot of big uh, generalities. And one is um, the behavior of jumping, right? Jumping on, which so many people complain about. It's been labeled as a nuisance behavior. It's certainly not on the laundry list of the well-behaved dog because well-behaved dogs, like well-behaved children, don't move, don't talk, don't communicate <laughs> unless I say, you know, do this. Um, so what would it mean instead of kind of automatically labeling that jumping behavior, dogs putting their paws on us as a nuisance behavior, as something that needs to be stopped. What would it mean to really ask as a partner, okay, what does this mean for you? It doesn't mean I want to be knocked over by my dog, no. Uh, but, it, but it means dogs have many like us humans many different reasons for the behaviors that we engage in. And uh, so that is one way that my adaptation of grounding from human trauma studies to uh, the world of dogs has been eye-opening for me, but also for many of the people that have been my clients and people who have taken my free webinar on this because dogs often put their paws up on us as a form of grounding, self-centering, present centering to help themselves feel deeply safe. And that's very different from a nuisance behavior. It may mean that we want to 
change that. It doesn't mean we necessarily uh, can sustain a dog putting their paws on us, but it means we approach it from a completely different angle. Um, and, and, and in order to address that kind of jumping, we have to address the dog's need for deep safety. Just suppressing that behavior doesn't do anything to um, facilitate the emotional well-being of the dog or address their deep, deep, deep need for safety. I think that's a really good point. I think a lot of the a lot of the um, challenges we might see as being, um, you know, not the biggest, but like you say, the the nuisance things. Even for me, things like putting on a lead, for example, you know, which is seen as being automatically a training issue. But uh, as we know, uh, Victoria and I were talking about this a, a, a little while ago. If that dog, if that pulling is representative of a dog's nervous system that was all over the shop because they're struggling with the environment, they're struggling with other things, they're struggling with whatever's going on. Um, uh, it's not about the pulling, it's about their current physiological state. And I think it's the same when we think about a lot of these dogs. I, I was working with a dog a little while ago who um, just after each tricky situation in the social environment, they turned to jump up the caregiver. And and the dog was saying, I, I need to connect to you with you right now. And as you say, we don't want to be covered in murder, we don't want to be pushed over. And that's the argument that gets thrown back. Oh, yeah, you're going to be permissive. You're going to be. It's not just recognizing, OK, I can see where that's coming from. How can I provide that connection for you? How can I let you know of my presence? Some of the um, presentations that were done as part of the Bark series with Sindor and uh, the Bark's family really show different ways of looking at some of these things. Some of the things that you talk about in your workshops, Laura, there are different ways that we can we can bridge that. Uh, and I think this is where it comes back to this thing about asking different questions, mm -hmm. not falling back to the same old tropes. I think that's important. Uh, Suzanne, I, I think, you know, thank you, Laura. <laughs> um, on the mindset side of things then, Suzanne, I, I think, you know, you've been talking about shifting to a more relational model for a long time, <laughs> you know, it's uh, it's uh, it's a while, and um, uh, and I know you've shared with me before about the resistance that came with that. What, what, why do you think it can be difficult to think about a more relational rather than just purely transactional model? Well, I have been talking about that for a very long time since uh, we sold the rights to Bones in '98. So I was talking about that long before. We actually uh, tried to sell the, the book rights. So that's a long time. You guys can do the math. It, it was a matter of going out on a limb, ignoring what science at the time told us, um, and simply believing what the animals told me about relationships and the value of that versus teaching stuff. Um, and I was lucky enough, and I think it was Maya who said it might have been Sindor, that people have always found a way to be in healthy, happy, um, comfortable, mutual relationships with animals. That's that's historically true. And so tapping into that um, tradition, which some people thought was fiction, you know, um, and other people were living it and I got to see that. So the hard part, I think, is that it's very hard for people to go against the flow. We know that there's a lot of peer pressure. A lot of my work was dismissed as, oh, um, they actually told my husband, he went to a, a seminar with me and they said, oh, that's all guru stuff. Who knows what the hell? It's all flaw, flaw, you know, new agey. What does she know? Um, so I've just really enjoyed over the last 25 years watching science um, systematically prove what I had actually felt strongly and acted on. Um, and for some people, they want some evidence, some proof that they're right because they are not comfortable going out on a limb. There is always the fringe element, and this is this is what holds society together, right? The center holds really, really tight, and the fringes pull really hard, and then somewhere in between, we all find our spot on the spectrum. But it's very difficult to find a spot where you can say, I'm sorry, this is my dog and my relationship and this is how I'm going to do me. That takes a, a certain mindset and a willingness to, um, especially if you're out there running your mouth like I was, um, to be shot at and dismissed and um, 
And it's like, well, you do you. And I'm going to keep doing me. I felt like it was life of Brian. Sometimes I'd turn around like, why are you all following me? You know, and they're like, tell us more. It's like, hmm, that was not why I was saying this, but all right. So I think, I think people are starting to feel a little more comfortable. Like, oh, science says, therefore they can. It's like, mm -hmm. they're missing the point how faulty and just glacially slow science is. So you know, is there a study that proves that? It's like, no, but you could go out and talk to a real animal and ask the real animal, is this true for you? Because regardless of what science says, um, the real animal will always give you the real answer. Always, whatever species that is. And so that, that I hope is where we can go in the future is learning how to ask those other questions. How is this for you is one of my elemental questions. How is this for you? Who are you? How do you operate in the world? Can you, can you physically, mentally, emotionally do this thing that I'm hoping we can do together? May I, do we even have permission to interact with you in that way? And then can we is really about your strengths, your, your limits, your interests, mine together. What are we capable of that? And hello, compromise my six elemental questions. And those set a very different framework as um, Laura just said when we ask a different question we automatically see things differently so when we're asking can you and the dog you know as um, uh, who was it was saying uh, earlier when we were talking backstage Sarah had said you know the service dogs that were already physically having limits just because they were always on the left and always given treats and always cranked this way so if we don't notice that, or we don't know how to ask that question, can you, it's going to, it's like hanging wallpaper. It's not too bad. You're like, oh, that's close enough. And it's just this far off. But 20 feet later, you think, oh my God, <laughs> it looks like a drunk monkey hung that. Um, yeah. So I think asking different questions, but we need to empower people to actually listen to what their own feelings and their own experiences tell them because this is the hallmark of my work is the readers that that come or they show up at my workshops and they're like i'm not crazy i read your book and i realized i'm not crazy this did not fit well this did not suit me and my dog oh i don't have to take my dog for 42 you know outings a, a month and take him out in public it's like no you can enjoy the garden and your house you don't have to take this dog out in a big, scary world. They're like, oh, thank God. So the, the message they get is so at odds with what their dog is telling them and what their experience with their horse or their dog or their chicken or their pig. You pick an animal. If you're not listening to the animal, you're not going to be right. That's all there is to it. Right in that really good sense that everything is in balance and everything is authentic. That's That's what I mean by right, not some... Victorian sense of well-behaved dogs don't jump. No one ever told my dogs that, by the way. I love that, Susan. Thank you. I think what you're saying there is it's okay to have a study of one. And I think what you're also saying, and I and I think this a, a lot of the voices that um yourself, Sindor, Sarah, everybody on this panel, really, I think, have been given the opportunity either through some of the dogs that I had with me, it was Milo, who definitely opened my eyes, uh, or the influence of other people to actually observe the animal and get that feedback. I think this is another part of the shift. This is this is the future hope for us, is that actually we can be humble enough to say, I'm going to ask this of you, what's the feedback? Is this working for you? Because when we start thinking in those terms, a lot of those discussions, especially when those discussions, when we think about the more punitive, heavy, aversive side of stuff, well, that ain't ever going to be a good response back for the dog because it ain't going to be good, is it? That's the key. And I think it's allowing them ourselves... And also for our colleagues listening in, freeing themselves from being stuck in that kind of thing about somehow having to defend things based on that old way of looking. Actually, it's a case of, well, that's not how I look at stuff. I care about the dog's experience. I care about that feedback. That's the thing that we need to focus in on, not get pulled back into that other discussion about, yeah, but I could do it quicker. Like you were saying, Maya, you know, this thing about I could do it better, I could do it quicker. And I think especially when, um, you know, I've got a lot of respect for, I was talking to a friend of mine, Kate, the other day, who's very high up on the um, agility side of things here in the UK, she's a lot of agility. Uh, 
she went to a sh uh, thing uh, a couple of weeks ago. Her dogs weren't feeling it. She didn't do it. It takes a lot because she wants to do it. And she said, I really wanted to win it. And I really want to do stuff. Can you want to get more? But actually, the dog came first. I think this is the key is that the feedback was from her dog. I'm not feeling it today. So she didn't do it. That's a wonderful thing. It's just a beautiful thing. I think it's really beautiful.